I have good news for you. I don't have any slides. <laughs> we don't have to deal with, with that uh, for my talk. I'm old school. I just talk. I was going to set a timer, but I, ha I have one. Uh, I, I want to actually, this is, you know, I'm known for my positivity. And, <laughs> and so I wanted to do something in this talk that is extraordinarily positive. I want to call you all to be a lot more cynical. Um, this is, talk really is a call to cynicism. Uh, in a very productive manner, and I think it's very important. It's the Marxification of gender. I want to start, actually, I'm going to tell you a story. I've got to look up something on my phone so I can read it to you in a second. Um, you'll have to take my word for this, because as it happens, I was interviewing with the BBC, and I think I had a got you moment on the, on the journalist because it never got published. And I did have the savvy, but I didn't have the care to record the thing on my end as well so I could share it with you. But I was speaking with the BBC and they were asking me various questions and in fact it was nothing about whatever the, the subject was supposed to. I don't remember what they wanted to interview me about, but they interviewed me about how controversial I am instead, which seemed kind of gotcha. And so this gentleman, I had one of the most British moments of my entire life, so the British people in the room will understand and pardon the imitation I'm about to do. So I had this gentleman, and I don't remember his name, it was with Helen Lewis was the, was the other interviewer, and, and the gentleman said, well, aren't you caught up in that groomer controversy? Would you care to explain yourself? So you all know about the OK Groomer thing, right? And I said, I have a, a standard way to reply to this now, this, would you like to account for accusing allegedly whatever this conglomeration of acronyms and LGBTQ plus hot dog emoji I, I, FP2S, there's numbers and stuff now, R2D2, I don't know. I have a standard way of responding to this now, which is, okay, I understand you don't like the G word, groomer. So I'm going to read to you something from not just the academic literature, but the education literature from a paper called Drag Pedagogy, which explains why Drag Queen Story Hour exists. It was written by one of the drag queens that does Drag Queen Story Hour. So straight from the horse's mouth as it were, and I said, you don't like the word groomer, I'm gonna read you something, I would like to know what word I should use. So I'll read this to you, this is from the end of the abstract and then I'll read the first par some of the first paragraph from the conclusion. Ultimately, the authors propose that drag pedagogy produces a performative approach to queer pedagogy that is not simply about LGBT lives, but living queerly. Near the conclusion it says, queer world making, including political organizing, has long been a project driven by desire. Ew. <laughs> it is in part enacted through art forms like fashion, theater, and drag. We believe that Drag Queen Story Hour offers an invitation toward deeper public engagement with queer cultural production, particularly for young children and their families. It may be that Drag Queen Story Hour is, quote, family friendly, in the sense that it is accessible and inviting to families with children, but it is less a sanitizing force than it is a, and here's the sentence, preparatory introduction to alternate modes of kinship. Here, Drag Queen Story Hour is, quote, family friendly, in the sense of, quote, family as an old, squeer, old school queer code to identify and connect with other queers on the street. So I said, what word am I supposed to use for that since you don't like groomer? And my British friend said, oh, well, yes. <laughs> the single most British moment of my life. <clears throat> And then he followed it up as a journalist would immediately, be, but don't you think it's dangerous to point it out? <laughs> to which I said, no, I think it's dangerous not to point it out. <laughs> and so all apologies for the accent. What we're dealing with here is a search then for words. This has come up a number of times in a number of talks. We're looking actually more for not just what, what are meant by these words, family, friendly, family, drag queen, story hour. But we're looking actually for a taxonomy of what's going on, and that's kind of what I want to give you. And so this talk is called The Marxification of Gender. I'm probably going to have to mention Marx at some point. But before I mention Marx, I want to give you a maxim that has to do with Marxist thought. This is a genuine maxim. This isn't some criticism of Marxists from outside. It is the issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. The issue 
is never the issue. The issue is always a revolution. The issue is never gender. The issue is a revolution. The issue is never Israel. The issue is a revolution. The issue is never Ukraine. The issue is the revolution. The issue is never COVID. The issue is the revolution. Again and again and again and again, these are pretexts for a revolution. Not by everybody participating, not every doctor, not every parent, not every care provider, not every whatever else, but by activists who, though they may be few in number, relatively speaking, know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly how to leverage the issue to create division, to create fights, to create the dialectic, as it were, to move history toward its inevitable progress uh, to, to the utopia when all of these issues like gender and capitalism and so on are resolved. And so I want to give a little history with that. Why Marx? Well, Marxism is ultimately behind much of the philosophy that led us here. But what was Marx all about? And a lot of people think, well, he's an economic theorist, and this is not correct. Marx was not answering the question of how economies work. We can see, you know, judge them by their fruits. You see how that system works when put into practice. It runs people by the millions into the blender. Marx was a theologian. Marx was fundamentally answering the question, who are people? Who are we? What does it mean to be human and what do we do with it? And he had an answer to that question. Human beings are an intrinsically social species. If we could just get to know ourselves or really to remember ourselves, absent the ideologies of capitalism, predicated on the division of labor and the, the ownership of private property. And if we could just abolish private property, we could remember who we are as a perfectly social species, a socialist man, and be reborn through revolution, hence that always being the issue, because it's a religious right. It's an act of rebirth and renewal. This isn't my interpretation. They say this again and again and again and again if you bother to read Marxist literature, that it is a process of rebirth, that the new socialist man or the new Soviet man or the new sustainable and inclusive man will come out of this revolution. Marx, at the end of the day, was convinced that human beings are a perfectly social entity who's forgotten that he's social because some people have stuff and other people don't. They set up a system of exploitation that advantages themselves to keep the people they exploit down, alienated from who they actually are. In fact, those people, the bourgeois class, is an alien force imposing itself on humanity. And you have the entire oppressed versus oppressor dynamic built into that mentality. For Marx, it was economic conditions that produced who we were. We were economic man, in a sense. And his goal was to seize the means of production, not of economic systems, but therefore of man himself, to bring him back to what he was always meant to be. This is really not an economic theory at all. This should really be called sociological Gnosticism. This is the Gnostic cults reinvented in a sociological and economic context. Man can come to know who he really is and set himself free, liberate himself, emancipate himself from the prison of being. All we have to do is seize the means of production that are keeping us from knowing who we are as spiritual entities. When we listened to Colin talk this morning, we heard all this stuff about your body versus your brain, the primacy of the mind. It's a spiritual practice. Church for them is showing up in hundreds of thousands and running down the street carrying flags, chanting slogans, not tipping over statues. That's church. When you see the protests, see church. It's Marxist church. But it turns out that the item that produces man, the phenomenon that produces man is fungible. For Marx, it was economic conditions. The explanation is actually really simple. Industrial revolution, blah, blah, blah. We can be high-minded about it, or we could just say Marx didn't want to get a job. <laughs> Marx wanted to be heralded for his genius, for all of his writings. His mother, in fact, quipped, Marx writes a lot about capital, it'd be nice if he earned some. <laughs> Marx didn't want to get a job. He wanted to be recognized for his brilliance. The frustrated academic is one of the most dangerous animals to exist on the planet. And so he cooked up an entire cult religion based on, I shouldn't have to have a job. But if you take out economic conditions as a producer of man and retool this 
in other places. Let's say that the imposition of racial categories that benefit whiteness, construed as a form of private cultural property, and the, needs to be, the production of that needs to be seized or whiteness needs to be abolished, you just end up with CRT. Critical race theory falls right out. It's completely fungible. Same operating system, different input. Same theory comes out really in practice. Well, it turns out that there are some people among us, as some would have it, who believe that certain people, like myself, said I'm normal and everybody else isn't. Or everybody that I don't like isn't. Some of us are normal. Some of you are freaks, weirdos, abnormal, deviants, degenerates, perverts, pedophiles. Some kind of stigmatizing word that causes harm and trauma that we need safe and inclusive spaces to protect us from. Turns out that if you take the, the form of private property of normalcy, a bourgeois property that the people who considered themselves normal in the first place declared that they alone possess, and if you want access to the fruits of society, you gotta get on board with the normal train. If you take that as a form of bourgeois property that has to be abolished, you get queer theory. You just plug it into the Marxist engine and you get queer theory. When I d delivered the remarks I gave at the European Parliament in March, I gave this idea in terms of genus and species. If we start thinking of Marxism as a genus, what we usually think of as classical Marxism as a species, critical race theory as a species, queer theory as a species, fat studies as a species, ability studies as, a, as another species, critical education theory where knowledge is now the bourgeois property. Who is a knower? Who has knowledge? Paulo Freire, the Brazilian Marxist, is a species. Postmodernism seems right out there and way out in left field, right? Who gets to be a meaning maker and who doesn't? Who gets to assign what has meaning in the world and who doesn't? Well, that's a bourgeois property that we're going to deconstruct. It's the same engine again and again and again and again. And that's why these things are so incestuous. What we're dealing with, broadly speaking, is a form of romantic idealism that's called, in my view, my, my coinage, sociological Gnosticism. Man is born free, but everywhere he's in chains. And there's your father of the whole thing, that's Rousseau who inspired Hegel, who inspired Kant, who inspired Marx, who gave us all of this wonderful revolutionary thought. <clears throat> in addition, Robespierre, speaking of revolutions. So how in the world did queer theory come to be then? If we're, this is Marx, this is the Marxification of gender. How did this happen? And now I know I'm very aware of my audience. I'm, I don't get nervous, but I might be a little bit. Because I'm very aware of my audience, because I'm about to lay some blame. Hold on, I gotta get, I gotta duck. <laughs> on the feminists. <laughs> In particular, we've already heard it, it's, it's wonderful to follow Alex. He set, he set all this up perfectly, and because he was constrained for time, he didn't have the opportunity to steal all of my thunder, which I'm sure he could have done extraordinarily well. But Simone de Beauvoir becomes a very crucial figure in this. Her question, what is a woman, or her statement more, one is not born but becomes woman, actually is this sociological Gnostic exploration. She wanted to understand what it means to be woman absent the pressures of patriarchy. For woman to become, as we might say in the German, Frau an sich, paraphrasing Hegel, to understand the thing in itself absent the imposed understandings of it. So woman is gonna discover woman outside of the idea of patriarchal definition. And you're absolutely right to draw the line straight to Matt Walsh, but also to Kentonji Brown Jackson, who gave us the right answer when asked by Marsha Blackburn, Senator Blackburn, what is a woman? Kentonji Brown Jackson said, I'm not a biologist. Well, she did step in it there, because she didn't say gender studies expert or something, but what she said was correct, and that's why they didn't crucify her for this. She said, we have to ask an expert. We need a guru to solve that for us. Nobody could answer that for themselves. There's no objective criteria we could defer to to understand. And this is the long line of what is woman from Simone de Beauvoir and, God, I gotta duck again, gender criticality. Here's the problem. There are no such things necessarily as, the, the slippery slope I should say is a fallacy. But there is no such thing as a socially constructed slope that's not slippery. The second you admit of social constructivism, you are on a slippery slope. Because the second that you say gender is a social construct, but sex is not, somebody comes along and says, 
That's you asserting political authority to keep something that benefits you so that I can't have it. And so you have Simone de Beauvoir asking, what is woman? And as a result, gender critical feminism goes off in this whole direction. I'm perfectly sympathetic to the idea of very rigid gender roles, sex roles, I should say, really. Very sympathetic to the criticism of these things. I'm very grateful for some of the advances and strides that came because of feminism, but at the same time, gender's not wholly socially constructed. And if you get that wrong, the end point of that train ride, that subway ride, is exactly what Hegel said it would be. History uses people and then discards them. History used gender critical feminism and it has discarded them. TERFs, you have been discarded. And how did that get to be the case? Well, another man, a French man, who was a fan of the French Simone, named Michel Foucault, picked up the same line of thought. And he said, well, what is a homosexual? What is homosexual? How do we define homosexual? I don't know how to say that in German. In itself. Absent the binary of heterosexual versus homosexual. Absent the disciplinary uh, apparatus of the prison of society, out, absent the mental health apparatus of the clinic. How do we define homosexual as homosexual? In the entire same process that this is ultimately socially constructed and rooted in binaries that have to be overcome comes back into play and a full criticality of sexuality is born on the back of this. This becomes queer theory by virtue of yet another famous name. Now I've got a funny story about this lady. Judith Butler Contrary to the philosopher, Alex, I found the other day, not the other day, it's been about three months, I said, I got to look up something in gender trouble. I got to reference something. And I opened gender trouble, I didn't remember where it was, I'm flipping through, and I just stopped somewhere and I started to read and it wasn't the right place, but what I noticed, unfortunately, was, wow, Judith isn't that hard to read. I think they broke me. <laughs> like, she's pretty lucid, actually. This all makes sense. Uh, I think they broke me. But what Judith did was took all of this apparatus and boiled it down. I'm sure she would love for me to boil all of her work down to three words, but it's life is drag. Maybe we could do six, drag is life. Both of those with a semicolon in between. Life is drag and drag is life. And so we come back to the drag queen story hour thing, which is an opportunity not to enhance LGBT lives, but to invite young children to live queerly and find their alternate modes of kinship with their queer, quote, family they find on the streets. So that's Judith Butler. Judith Butler boils down all of this search for self absent the definitions that society might impose or the demiurge might impose, the social demiurge of soci uh, sociological Gnosticism. She boils it all down to everything we do as a performance, who we are as a performance. We perform gender, we perform our jobs, we perform everything we do. So then she asks the question that discarded the TERFs. If gender is socially constructed, why not sex? If, isn't that really kind of where it comes from? So if gender is socially constructed, why not sex? And there, unfortunately, the radical feminist movement went straight under the bus. And the entire Marxist apparatus that we've been kind of alluding to here progressed and left radical feminism on the dustbin of history. And you can stand and assert and scream, no, gender is socially constructed, but sex is not. And at the end of the day, they're gonna say, your privilege is showing. Femininity, womanhood works for you, but it doesn't work for everybody. You're trying to preserve sex, not because it's real, but because it benefits you to do so. You're a good feminist as opposed to Roxane Gay, who's a bad feminist. And what you end up with is a Marxist theory of sex and gender. It becomes a radical new sexual politics, as Gail Rubin put it in Thinking Sex in 1984, that David Halpern explains in 1995 when he writes, Saint Foucault, if there's anybody who's not eligible for sainthood, in my opinion, now I understand the corruptions of the churches, it might be Michel Foucault, but he goes for a gay hagiography or hagiography for this, this book and he explains what queer means. And this is what we're ultimately dealing with. He says that queer is an identity without an essence, which is a very complicated concept. 
Because it's inherently, he says, defined in terms of opposition to that which is normal, legitimate, and dominant. It is inherently opposed to that which is legitimate. Which means when you say sex is legitimate because my gametes, it is inherently opposed to that and conflates normal, legitimate, and politically dominant into one structure. So now we're back in that Marxist apparatus. There's the dominant group and the people who benefit from it who are constructing society so that the people that are excluded from that circumstance are not allowed to have the benefits of society and are in fact exploited and alienated from who they actually are, which in this case, if you can actually find many of the queer activists writing this and saying this, is that they are, every person is ultimately queer, they just haven't discovered it yet. It's like the paradox of the closet. You only know if you're in the closet when you realize you're in the closet. You might be in the closet all along up until that moment. It's this pre-epistemic state of not knowing if you're gay or straight, trans or, I'm not even gonna use the other thing. It's not real, it's constructed. And what we end up with is the Marxification of gender designed to create this fight. It's designed to pit people against one another. It's designed to put us in a situation where we have to have biologists with PhDs standing up here and telling you, by the way, <laughs> men and women, not the same. <laughs> and they can make a legitimate joke that this is a Nobel Prize worthy winning discovery <laughs> if the Nobel Prize wasn't itself a piece of corrupt apparatus crap for the whole fake regime. But this is what it all gets to because we've heard a lot about truth this and truth that and truth everything, right? And the truth is a political contrivance if we believe Michel Foucault or some of these other people. The truth is a political, he's not that smart. Marx said this too. If you go to Marxist.org, they have a whole glossary, it's great. You should read their definitions for how they misuse words. They know what they're doing not everybody you encounter, but the actual Marxists know what they're doing. They've redefined every word in, term of power, in terms of power dynamics in Marxist theory. Truth is one of those words. So they say that all truth is relative because, as it turns out, in Faust, speaking through the voice of the character Mephistopheles, who's the mouth of Satan, Goethe said, everything that exists deserves to perish. Therefore, all truth is relative because it's in this poem about Satan. That's in the essay about truth on Marxist.org, but then they go on to characterize that there are four different types of truth. There's rational truth, which is where everything has to be logically consistent and coherent. There's empirical truth, where you have to check off of evidence. There's pragmatic truth, where that which works is true enough. And then there's Marxist truth, where it's exactly like pragmatist truth, except that it has to advance Marxist theory too. So that which advances Marxist theory, that which moves us closer to the revolution, because the issue is never the issue, the issue is always the revolution, that which moves us closer is true, that which moves us further away is false. History uses movements and then discards them because we have to continue moving closer and closer to a revolution that's perpetual. You look at those flags, right? Now I know there's probably a number of you in here who for all good reasons that you can possibly imagine waved a flag with a rainbow on it with six stripes and marched in parades and did lots of things that you have every right to be proud of for the fights that you fought and the victories that you won that were about acceptance, they're about equality, and that are certainly not anymore. And then now there's this weird wedge coming in from the side. And the weird wedge not only grows, but it keeps adding more stuff, right? First it had some different colors, it had the black and the brown stripes, and it added some trans stripes, and then there's this weird yellow field that's now in incorporated with a circle on it. Now they're trying to put that umbrella on the wedge. This is a flag of perpetual revolution. The revolution will be revolutionized as it proceeds. Nothing will be stable. Whatever you think is good now will get taken over and bulldozed and revolutionized the next turn. So I want to urge you to understand that what we're dealing with is not just these issues where we have to fight in what we might call the blast zone. People are being harmed. Children are being harmed. Kids are being indoctrinated, brainwashed in schools, not indoctrinated, brainwashed in schools to accept these ideas. We have a major problem on our hands. But I want you to be cynical and think it's not just about these issues that we have to fight, and we do. We do have to get the biology out there. We do have to get the policy right. We do have to deal with the institutional capture. We have to deal with all of these practical issues day by day by day. 
We do need the feminists standing up and fighting for sex. We do. But you have to adopt a little bit more cynicism that some of the people that are the core activists driving the people who are doing the implementation of this know exactly what they're doing. And their goal is a revolution that overthrows our society. And I would argue, and I have argued at length in the past, that it's exactly the same revolution that took place in China from 1966 to 1976. It is a cultural revolution, malweaponized identity politics with different classes, the good classes and bad classes of people, weaponized those so that the people would fight, people would strive to do anything to get into the positive classes and to shun the, the negative classes, the world's first social credit system, really, outside of the Puritans. And then he weaponized a formula he called unity criticism unity. You start with a desire for unity. You criticize those elements that are pre preventing us from achieving full unity and then with, with struggle and struggle sessions, and then you can have a new unity on a new basis. That was his formula. We today say we just want to create a place where everybody feels like they belong, but you're very problematic with your transphobic and racist views, so we're going to have to teach you to do better so that we can have a sustainable and inclusive future. It's the exact same formula. The conclusion is going to be the same. I heard Lysenko's name invoked earlier. Medical Lysenkoism, not just through the trans issue in medicine, but through the social determinants of health, through racial equity, through all of these other aspects, through sustainability even. This, this will kill tens of millions of people. This is a hard and cold reality. This ideology has taken over the American Medical Association, the AAP, the nature, you name it, Lancet, BMJ, you, fit, you pick it, your favorite, the New England Journal of Medicine, this ideology is in all of them. I could hoax every one of those journals. I just need somebody's medical numbers to put on the application. <laughs> you will lose it, you'll lose your license. So I need you to be more cynical in some of your interpretations. We've got to fight in this blast zone. We've got to advocate for the truth. We have to get clarity on how to communicate the truth, which is most of what this is. The biologists are not confused about men and women. We're desperately searching for how to cut through the linguistic manipulations to communicate to everyday people who Marx would call mystified so that they can understand how this is happening around them. So I need you to be more cynical. But I also want you to be hopeful. Cynicism here gives you the ability to sidestep the fact that the issue doesn't matter. The issue is a tool. The issue will be dropped the second it's not useful any longer. Like when Zelensky asked if he could participate in some of, the Ukraine, or some of the Israel stuff and they told him, no, we don't need you anymore. The issue, as soon as it moves on and is no longer useful, will be dropped. You can point this out with your cynicism. You can point this out. You can say, yes, there's all of these things happening with the fight about sex and gender and whatever the issue is in queer theory and the whole thing about children in schools, but what is its other purpose? What ulterior motive do the most cynical actors in the game have in qui bono? Who benefits from it? How does it advance this revolution against our society? And this will shape your analysis and give you the ability to call out what's really happening while we're fighting in the blast zone. Meanwhile, though, I want to call you not just to cynicism, but to hope. The world, and I've been doing this a number of years, the world has woken up so quickly. Parents are so motivated. People are so interested in hearing what's happening so fast that we have a real chance of stopping a cultural revolution. I don't even think we have a chance. I think we are doing it. We are currently doing it. The lawsuits will come. People will be protected. Our children will get to grow up healthy and happy. We're going to remember what liberty is about. We're going to remember that it's a republic if we can keep it, and for a generation or two at least, we will, and we will teach our children to do what it takes to keep it. Not just to sit by and ask the question I heard from the back, how in the world did all this happen? Were we asleep at the wheel? We were, and now we're not. So not just cynicism, but hope. And put those together. Don't black pill. There are people with an agenda. Their agenda is not good. Gender is a tool for them. There's always this duality. The feminist movement was very valuable for many things, and at the same time, it had this fellow traveler that was not. That was a revolutionary ideology. Gay movement, queer theory, same thing. We can carve out 
the civil rights movement and protect people and give people better lives while stopping the revolutionary parts in their tracks if we're willing to start to be discerning and a little more hopeful and a little more cynical. Thank you. I'm being threatened with questions. Stay tuned. This is a surprisingly difficult room. Okay, I got you. You're behind the pole. I got you. Um, what do you say to um, like potential college students that are going through this um, and know someone that's being indoctrinated with these ideas? Um, how, what, what advice would you give to them? Okay, so what, what we're dealing with here is a cult, and so the people that are getting brainwashed or indoctrinated into these ideas are being induced or initiated into a cult. By the way, uh, Eve Sedgwick, speaking of queer theorists, wrote very explicitly in the Epistemology of the Closet that there's a binary between innocence and initiation, and the goal, they say repeatedly, is to overcome in, uh, innocence they will, in favor of initiation, so you can tell it's a cult. Uh, but when you're dealing with a cult, it's very difficult. Like, you can't talk to people that are in a cult like normal. Like, their whole... Uh, cognitive dissonance architecture has been built through the brainwashing to resist not being in the cult any longer. So what I tell people, college students, parents more actually, is that what they need to understand is you need to be truthful and you need to, you need to let them know that you don't agree. You do not have to and in fact you may be best not to argue with them very often. You have to let them know that you don't agree and that if they have a question you're there and otherwise you maintain the relationship. You have to be the person when they see finally whatever it is, they're like, wait a minute, they want to gas Jews? That they come to you and say, what's going on? You want to be that person. So that happens by you making sure it's clear to them that you value the relationship, that you're going to maintain the relationship despite the difference, whatever sacrifices in terms of talking about things that requires, but also uh, that you're there for them as a landing pad that, because you disagree and have answers when they come seeking them. You can't, well maybe like really good people, psychologists that are really good at it can pull people out of a cult, but for the most part normal people cannot. Cult deprogramming is they get, they see through the mystification, they have questions, and then you feed them a red pill or two. So be a landing pad. Behind the other pole. Yeah, behind the other pole. You don't hear this thrown around as much <clears throat> nowadays in these terms, but a few years ago there was a lot being made, uh, a lot of stink being made about I'm in the 90% versus the 10% that's holding all the wealth, all this wealth is controlled in the hands of just a few. Um, so I think it's a lot of what Bernie is all about. Yeah. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how that rolls into all of this. Well, I. Oh, or if sorry, that has been dropped as a, well, as a hot potato topic in favor of things like gender. Yeah, well, the question is, how dropped is it? I don't know, because if this is ultimately on an economic, or Marxist engine, you see it with even this Israel-Palestine stuff. You see people saying that it's about ending capitalism. So that didn't quite go away. Um, but the fact is that, the, that the, as, as the people who would, would use it would pronounce it, the elites... Uh, you know, when they put the diacritical mark on it when they're in, in the Atlantic, uh, they don't pronounce it elite like normal people because they're so elite uh, <laughs> that they have to say it differently for themselves. The, the elites realized that uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement was dangerous to them and the Tea Party movement was dangerous to them and that those two movements were getting awfully close to realizing that they had way more in common than they had apart. And so what did they do? It's time to deploy the progressive stack at Occupy. And so all of a sudden it was like, no, no, we can't let you speak because you're the wrong color and all these organizers who happen to be white were getting accused of racism for letting the wrong people speak or speaking too much. The whole progressive, the woke stack, gender, sex, race, race uh, ability, stack, the whole thing all got implemented and it pretty much fractured the Occupy movement. It broke it apart. It's very actually destructive. Intersectionality is one of the most destructive things that's ever been unleashed uh, in getting people to fight about small differences <laughs> amongst each other and ignore the big difference, or the big matters, the, the big issues that are actually causing the problem. 
And it turns out the, the elites noticed this and weaponized it. And all of a sudden, you had all these banks that were failing. And that was kind of some of the part. And then they got bailed out. And then they're really big again. And all of a sudden, they, you know, it's like, you know, Goldman Sachs with a rainbow flag behind it or something like that. So all of a sudden, they had like a moral shield to hide behind. And they've weaponized this ever since. They realized that they could hide behind the noble and valuable and amazing legacy of these civil rights movements to advance an increasingly radical politic. And the grant money started to go increasingly to radicals who, turns out, don't really care that much about the civil rights movement because they're narcissists and they just care about the navel-gazing self-worship that they're engaged in and driving the agenda toward the revolution. That said, uh, I think, and this is a whole other complicated talk, but I think that what we're seeing is that the kind of sociological Gnosticism, Marxism writ large, is evolving through different phases. It goes through an idealist phase, and it goes through a cultural phase, and it goes through a materialist phase, actually in the other order. So the ideals, where in woke is idealist, there's this kind of, it's out there, there's gender souls and all of this, ideal person, the mental is prime, but the next phase is materialist, and the materialist phase is this sustainability thing, degrowth. And so what we're going to see is this giant push toward no plastic, no fossil fuels, no energy, lots of starvation, everybody freezing to, get to death in the dark. And that's where you're going to have some real problems uh, because <laughs> that's the phase where people die in large numbers and things have to be rethought. But I think that what we'll see is that that, and that destruction of capitalism hasn't gone away, but to mobilize the normal everyday economic citizen against the elites, uh, that's, that's really the uphill battle. But I think that we're actually, this is another thing we're starting to wake up to. You know, it's, there's great skepticism of the United Nations, the World Health Organization, UNESCO. Why is this in schools in every country? I just met a guy from Kenya. He was like telling me what's going on in the schools there. It, it might as well have been San Francisco. In Kenya. Why? Because UNESCO, because the United Nations is pushing the, the agenda into every one of its 193, they remind you every day, member states. These things are actually politically solvable problems, though. And then the skepticism that we're having that's growing, especially in the younger people on the conservative side of things, uh, of these major institutions, I think will actually help us sail out of that and get it back to where this kind of upper crust of oligarchs, not even the elites or the wealthy or whatever, oligarchs are gonna find themselves to be in a precarious situation to either desist, if you will, or to uh, face the wrath of the, probably, to be honest with you, 99.9999%, which is not really good odds for them. Okay. I'm free. <laughs> <laughs>